Jesus' name, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' name, Father. All righty then. I'm live. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm in a new location, even though I've used this location previously, right? I've used this location previously. You guys, if you're on Paltok, you know, child of God, a blessed brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's also a man who loves Jesus Christ, blessed by the Holy Spirit to know the scriptures, to teach the scriptures. And this is his home. So he's allowing me to use his own Protestant believer. You know what's up. We're in child of God's home right now. Right. So I won't go into the details. Now it's not talking about mental health issues. But that sounds okay. Anyway, uh, I couldn't live stream at my brother's place because it was occupied. So he allowed me to come here and do a live stream at the last minute. So thank him. Pray for child of God. Ask the Lord Jesus to bless him in his household. Don't forget that the Lord Jesus in his mercy will bless all the homes that, in, that invite me and welcome me in, right, to bless my brother's home because he's been gracious enough to allow me to stay there until I get a place. Ask the Lord Jesus to show him mercy in his household. Ask the Lord Jesus to show child of God mercy and bless his household. Ask the Lord Jesus to bless me and my household, my daughters. So I'm here using his internet connection, which is much stronger, much better than the internet connection at my brother's home. So pray for that. Pray the Lord Jesus will help me because today, guys, honestly, it was kind of rough. When I opened up to you last night, this is what happens to me. When I face a trial, my first reaction is that <clears throat> my flesh kicks in, tries to weaken me, tempt me, and then I start struggling with fleshly desires. And so I just need your prayers that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will crucify my flesh. The Holy Spirit will seal me and empower me to walk in the life of the Spirit, to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, not to be a hypocrite, not to disqualify myself, but to despise my flesh and die to my flesh and to walk in purity and holiness covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because what happens to me when I get attacked or I get depressed is that I'll either <clears throat> indulge in food, gluttony, and then I struggle with just, you know, fleshly carnal desires. So pray God's Spirit will give me victory to die to that and walk in the spirit and not allow depression or fears or anxieties to give me a license to indulge my flesh, but to rebuke that in Jesus' name and to crucify my flesh and walk in the life of the spirit. Because I don't want to be a hypocrite, folks. I truly want to be a slave of Jesus Christ, truly in love with Jesus Christ, truly worshiping Jesus Christ, obeying Jesus Christ, magnifying Jesus Christ, even when no one's watching, right? I don't want to put on a show. And I'm not here to tickle people's ears, right, or to be pleasing to men. I want to be pleasing to Jesus Christ. I want to be in love with Jesus Christ. I want to be worshiping Jesus Christ when I'm alone, praying, fasting, studying the scriptures, meditating on the word, when no one's watching, right? But pray for me that God will have mercy on me and be patient with me and then give me the grace to be compassionate, merciful, and patient with my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? May the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit be magnified through us, through imperfect fleshly vessels. May the Father, Son, Holy Spirit crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, fill us with life, power, fruit from the Holy Spirit of the living God, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, purified in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray the Father will also purify our loved ones, purify your loved ones, my loved ones, purify my daughters, even their mother, Purify us, cleanse us, cleanse them in the blood of Jesus. Keep us pure by the power of the blood of Jesus. Seal us by the power of the Holy Spirit and the fire of the Holy Spirit, just purging us of our flesh and crucifying our flesh and filling us with life and fruit and power from the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, and to forgive us when we succumb and not to make provision for the flesh and not to justify making provision for the flesh, but to war against the flesh with, with the fire of the Holy Spirit just consuming our flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us of our flesh. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Save us, Lord. Beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ, to shine with the beauty of Jesus Christ. And help us, Father. Help me in my weaknesses, Father. 
for the glory of your son, the Lord Jesus, and fill us with the spirit. Fill my, my chest and my lungs and my throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. Protect me from error and stammering and confusion. And Father, please, in Jesus' name, open our eyes to see the depth of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture, and to go deeper into the Scriptures and, and just to feast on the meat of Scriptures and live out the Scriptures, not just to preach, but live them for the glory of Jesus. Help us, Father. Please help us, Lord Jesus. Help us, Holy Spirit. Save us from attacks of the enemy. Surround us with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. And Lord, guide this conversation. And please, Abba, I pray this for myself and for everyone listening. After the session, when we're alone, give us the power of your Holy Spirit, not to succumb to the flesh, but to overcome the flesh and live in the life of the Spirit, Father. To be doers of your word, not just hearers or hypocrites, because we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And please, Abba, plant me here that I don't return to that other state. Do not let that happen. Plant me here for your glory, to glorify Jesus. And bring my daughters here in Jesus' name. And save us, save me from this corrupt legal system. In Jesus' name, Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. All right. I'm going to have to retitle the session. Pray God keeps me disciplined. Give me the grace of self-control to keep eating healthier, to get healthier, lose more weight, to beatify me, and to be holy for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? I'm almost there. When it comes to my health goals. But in Jesus' name, I know he's with us, right? Anyway, what I was about to say. I'm going to have to retitle the session because I'm going to cover two topics. And pray for me. If God grants me the holiness I need to delight his heart and keeps me healthy and safe from this corrupt legal system, this wicked judge, so that I continue to serve the Lord Jesus, writing articles, doing <clears throat> live streams, going around teaching in churches and homes, traveling the world for the glory of Jesus. I will be finishing my series on Jesus Christ, not being the Archangel Michael. I will also finish my series on the Synoptic Gospels and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and eventually get into the Gospel of John. But I also want to cover other topics, dealing with the objections by various groups, particularly anti-Trinitarians against the Trinity, against Jesus Christ being God and man, against the personhood of the Holy Spirit, against the authority of scriptures, against the message of salvation, and also go into specific doctrines, you know, sanctification, justification, how to worship, how to pray. But that's where I need you guys to be praying for me, to be filled with wisdom and knowledge and the power to live the truth of God for the glory of Jesus and to be protected so I won't be hindered from doing these things, right? Because you see the satanic onslaught that's trying to stop me from doing this. So I'm going to retitle this session because I'm going to do two things. I'm going to discuss how to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove that Jesus is Jehovah. And I'm going to talk about the deity of Jesus in the Quran. I'm going to do two things today. Right? Two things today. Right? And by the way, I want you to go to my blog, Answering Islam blog answering islam blog dot wordpress dot com because i just pu published a two-part article that kills several birds with one stone i'm responding to a muslim blogger who tried to use the book of hosea to argue that muhammad is mentioned by name right so what i did was i just published a two-part refutation Proving that the theology of the book of Hosea, the theology of the book of Hosea exposes Muhammad as a false prophet and antichrist. And I do so by showing that according to the book of Hosea, this is why the, the, this two-part article is going to bless you. Here's part one. According to the book of Hosea, Jehovah God is a multi-personal being. The book of Hosea identifies the God of Israel as multi-personal. That Jehovah is not a singular person, but he's multi-personal, consisting of at least two divine persons, Jehovah and the angel of Jehovah. And I also demonstrate that according to Hosea, God's covenant people, God's covenant people, Israel, are the sons and daughters of God, 
all of which contradict the Quran, proving Muhammad is a false prophet. So how could a Muslim quote the book of Hosea to try to prove that Muhammad is mentioned by name, a book which teaches things about God and God's relationship with his people that directly oppose and contradict the message of the false prophet Muhammad, right? So there's the link. That's part one. Now let me get you part two. Let me find it first. Okay, Here's part two. And we'll dabble into that and discuss it, Lord Jesus willing. So thank the admins for joining me, for serving me, helping me to serve you. Thank Protestant for posting. Here's part two. Save the links. Read the material. Use the material in your witness and pass it on to others for the glory of the triune God. As the triune God beatifies me with the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. All right, everyone with me now? Are we in the saddle? Are we ready? Saddle, are we ready? Okay. We're going to do two things tonight, Lord Jesus willing. I'm going to show you how you can use the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh and how you can use the Quran to prove that Jesus is God, even though the Quran... <clears throat> presents a contradictory portrait of Jesus Christ. Now, for the record, I don't believe that Jesus of the Quran is the true Jesus of history, who is the Christ of the New Testament. The historical Jesus is revealed in the New Testament. That's the true Jesus of history. The one who claimed to be God in the flesh and proved it with signs and wonders, who died on the cross and then left the tomb empty, being raised to glorious immortality. The Isa of the Quran is a satanic counterfeit. Right. That's number one. Secondly, I don't quote the Quran because I believe the Quran is authoritative, that it's the word of God. So then why am I using the Quran? Because Muslims believe the Quran is the word of God. So I'm using evidence from their source of authority, from what they believe to be authoritative, to prove the truth of my position. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because you have Christians who think we should never quote the Quran to prove the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To those Christians, I want to exhort you, that's not a biblical position. That's not a biblical position. I will now demonstrate to you from the inspired scriptures, the Holy Bible, that prophets and apostles filled with the Holy Spirit would actually quote the sources of their opponents or the sources of the groups that they were witnessing to in order to establish the truth of their position. Did you know that? Yep, Riyaz just said it. Let's go to Acts 17, verse 28. Acts 17, verse 28. Let me prove it to you. So now, Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit, guided by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit how to witness. So if Paul, inspired by the Spirit, will cite the sources of the Greeks, Greek pagans, their poets and philosophers, to establish the truth of his position, that that's a precedence set by spirit-filled emissaries of God, <clears throat> encouraging us to do likewise. Acts 17, 28, and thank Protestant believer for citing. Paul here, notice what he's going to do. For by him we have life and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his children. Paul here is witnessing to the Athenians, Mars Hill, and he references their own poets, poets who made statements that were true, statements that Paul took and Christianized for the glory of Jesus Christ. Right? Are you seeing that? Now, you may, have, you may need a good study Bible or commentary telling you where these citations come from. Okay. He does it again in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Watch here. Lord Jesus, purify me in your precious blood and save me from my flesh. Do not be misled. Bad associators spoil useful habits. <clears throat> now, other translations will say, good company corrupts good morals. I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Holy Spirit, save me from error in Jesus' name. No mistakes. No stammering, no confusion. Other translations will render this as, do not be deceived. 
Bad company corrupts good morals. Okay. This too is a citation from a Greek source, right? He's quoting a Greek source that said something true. Bad company corrupts good morals. And then in Titus chapter 1, verse 12, he quotes a Cretan because Titus is in Crete in Turkey, and he quotes a Cretan prophet, someone considered a prophet by Cretans to show that even a fellow Cretan recognizes that his people are lazy gluttons. Titus 1.12. A certain one of them, their own prophet said, Cretans are always liars, injurious, wild beasts, idle gluttons. Notice he's quoting a false prophet. Because obviously this Cretan wasn't a true prophet of God, but he was someone considered a prophet by Cretans and saying, look, don't get upset at me that I'm saying that you're liars, lazy gluttons. Even someone that you consider to be a prophet said the same thing about you. Right? And guys, please help me to help you focus on the topic. Don't go into side, side issues and tangents and focus so you can learn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So right now we just established, we just established that the prophets and the apostles would quote, allude to, reference the sources of their opponents or the people that they were witnessing to, to establish the truth of their position. And you also find this in the Old Testament. If you guys don't have a good study Bible or a commentary on the books of the Old Testament, you won't realize that much of the language adopted in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, was taken by pagan literature, sources in which pagans made statements about their gods and goddesses, which the inspired writers took and applied to Jehovah. Did you know this? There are things in the Psalms in which the inspired authors, even in Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, in which the inspired authors are adapting language used by pagans in reference to their gods and goddesses and applying it to Jehovah. Why would they do that? Any good commentary, Michelle, on the Old Testament would note this. Because what they were saying, they were making a statement. Exactly. Daily Gripe mentioned. The writer on the clouds, the writer of the clouds, the cloud writer. In, in Canaanite mythology, and this is proven by sources found in Ugarit. Ugarit. <clears throat> the writer of the clouds, the cloud writer, was Baal, or Baal, the son of Il. And here that imagery of writing the clouds is taken over and applied to Jehovah. And in the book of Daniel, it's applied to the Son of Man. And in the New Testament, Jesus claims to be that Son of Man of Daniel who rides the clouds. But in the ancient Near Eastern culture, the Canaanites believed that it was Baal, Baal, who was the, the cloud rider, the rider of the clouds, the rider on the clouds. Do you know that? Did you know that? Before you before I move on? So why would the Old Testament writers adapt the imagery or the language of their pagan neighbors, which they use in reference to their gods and goddesses, because they're making a statement. You know what they're saying? What you say about your God actually applies to Jehovah, because Jehovah is the true God, not your God. So the things that you're saying about your gods and goddesses does not apply to them. They apply to the true God, Jehovah. So we're taking back the truth that you stole about Jehovah and applied, applied it to your gods and goddesses. That's what they were doing. Is, is it making sense? That's what they were doing. They're saying, no, Baal isn't the cloud rider, the rider of the clouds, the rider on the clouds. Jehovah is specifically the son of man, the second person of the Godhead. No, Il is not the father of the gods, right? The father of years. Jehovah is, he is the ancient of days, the father of the gods. You get it? That's what they were saying. Baal didn't defeat the sea monster Yam. 
right? Jehovah did. Baal didn't defeat Mot. Jehovah did. You get it? You see what's happening here? So what the Old Testament does, it takes back the language that the pagans misapplied in reference to their gods and goddesses and attributes them to the only true God, saying, no, what you're saying about Baal is a lie because that's only true of Jehovah. So we're taking back the language you stole about our God and wrongly applied it to your gods and goddesses. Making sense? Yep. That's that's why many scholars will tell you that the Old Testament is polemical in nature, meaning it's not simply a book written to tell us about who Jehovah is. It's also a book written to debunk and attack the beliefs of the pagans, right? Correcting their misappropriation of language that they use for the gods and goddesses language that only befits the majesty of Jehovah. So it's apologetic and polemical in nature. The books of the Old Testament and the New Testament are apologetic and polemical, meaning they're making a defense that Jehovah is the true God and attacking the gods and goddesses of their neighbors, of the ancient Near Eastern peoples. This is why many scholars will tell you that even Genesis 1 the account of the origin of the heavens and the earth is actually polemical. It's written in a way to attack the cosm cosmological beliefs of the near, ancient Near Eastern peoples, which is why some scholars will tell you, by the way, that's one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why in Genesis 1, the sun and the moon are not named directly. Because in the ancient Near Eastern beliefs, the sun and the moon were deities wrongly worshipped by the pagans along with the stars. And so Genesis 1 is a polemic demythologizing planetary worship, showing that the sun and the moon are not gods, goddesses. They're simply objects created by Jehovah as objects to mark out days, seasons, so on and so forth, right? Clear? So once you understand the context in which the books of the Old Testament, New Testament are written in, it will actually enrich you and actually blow you away that it's not just simply a statement of creation, of origins. It's a statement of origins intended to demythologize and attack the comparable cosmologies of the ancient Near Eastern peoples because they all had a story of how the planets came into being and how human beings were created. Genesis 1 is written to attack those cosmologies and saying, no, this is how it was done, and it was done by the only true God, Jehovah. With me there? The clear making sense? And don't take my word for it. Get any study Bible that has notes, copious notes, or any good commentaries on any of the books of the of the of the Bible. Pick up a good comment in Genesis, and they're going to give you a lot of background information because thank God for modern <clears throat> discoveries, archaeology. We found tablets of these ancient peoples, the Ibla tablets, tablets from Ugarit. That gives us an idea of what the peoples at the time of Abraham believed. That further illuminates our understanding of the Bible. Brings it to life. Right? And helps us appreciate the historical accuracy of the Bible. For instance, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Do you remember the story when Jacob is fleeing from his father, Lebanon? It says that Rachel took the household idols, the teraphim. It's in Genesis, right? And then it says, Lebanon chased Jacob, hunted him down until he caught up to him and said, where are the idols? 
the household idols. Now, he didn't know that Rachel, Jacob didn't know that Rachel had stolen them and she had hidden them, right? Now, for you and I, what's the big deal that she stole some idols? Why would he make a big fuss and chase Jacob, hunted him down until he caught up with him and demanded that he return the idols? Now, Jacob didn't know that Rachel had stolen them, right? Now, you know what the big deal is? Thank the triune God in preserving these ancient tablets and allowing us to uncover them. We now know that whoever owned the household idols had the right to the inheritance. So if you own the idols in your household, you could come back and claim your father's inheritance as yours. That's what Lebanon was worried about. Yep. Lebanon was worried about that, that later on Jacob would come and claim the inheritance and take it from his sons if he had the idols. And we only, we only know this because of these discoveries, these tablets that tell us about the customs of the peoples of the time. Now, you know why that's beautiful? That tells you how accurate the Old Testament is because it accurately reflects the customs of that time, a person writing centuries after the fact would not have known this. You with me? Making sense? And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to enable me to recall these facts correctly and save me from error for the glory of Jesus. And all of this you'll get in any good study Bible. If you can't afford commentaries, get a study Bible. Like NIV has study Bibles that deal specifically with the archaeological discoveries that helps illuminate understanding the Bible. And this will all come to life and provide even more evidence that these books are historically accurate to the glory of the Chime God. Exactly, Protestant believer. It is supernatural because it is the word of the true God. And these little nuggets confirm the historical accuracy of the books of the Bible, showing that whoever wrote Genesis must have been written at a time in which these customs were still known because someone coming centuries later would not know these things. Right? So again... Why did Rachel steal the household idols known as the teraphim? Because the custom of the time is whoever owned the idols of the household had the right to the inheritance. And that's why Lebanon chased Jacob. He's afraid that Jacob, if Jacob had the idols, he could come back later and claim the inheritance. Clear? Making sense, folks? Come on now. I want to see over 200. We're only 86, man. Come on. If CP can get 1,000, you better believe I can get that. Come on now. You guys got to advertise better for me. Okay. Let's go into some of the evidence from the Jehovah's Witness' own perversion of the Bible that proves that Jesus is Jehovah God. Are we ready? Are we ready? Okay. This is all going to be in my two-part rebuttal to that Muslim who tried to prove that Muhammad's name is mentioned in the book of Hosea. It's there in my two-part rebuttal. I just gave you the links. It's on my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. So if you want to go back and read the information, that's fine. But let's go to Zechariah 14, verses 1 of 5, using the Jehovah Witness Bible. Lord willing, during the week, I'm going to do another live Q&A session where I'll entertain your questions. Pray for my victory November 20th, folks. Remember, November 20th is a big, big day because a corrupt judge can try to hold me in contempt of court for fees that I did not accrue that in Jesus' name I won't pay. So pray for me. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Keep me out so I can keep doing this for the glory of Christ. Read with me. This is the Joe Witness Bible. Read with me. Look, the day is coming, a day belonging to Jehovah, 
when the spoil from you will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem for the war, and the city will be captured, and the houses plundered, and the women raped, and half of the city will go into exile, but the remaining ones of the people will not be cut off from the city. Pay attention to three to five. I had mentioned this in previous sessions, but we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God. Notice verses three and four carefully. Jehovah will go out and war against those nations as when he fights in the day of a battle. Now notice verse four. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Okay, what happens? When Jehovah comes to fight to save the remnant of Israel, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Jehovah's feet will touch the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a very great valley, and half of the mountain will move to the north and half of it to the south. You will flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will extend all the way to Azil. You will have to flee just as you fled because of the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Now watch this, the last part of verse 5. And Jehovah, my God, will come and all the holy ones will be with him. Notice what you just read. Jehovah, Zechariah's God, will descend on the Mount of Olives. His feet will touch the Mount of Olives. And from the impact of Jehovah's glorious feet, the Mount of Olives will be split in half. And Jehovah comes with his holy ones. The Hebrew word kadoshim, holy ones, can also be rendered as saints. Is it clear that Zechariah envisions a day where Jehovah himself will come down and Jehovah's blessed feet will actually physically touch the Mount of Olives and split it in half physically and he comes down with his holy ones? Did you see that? Do you guys see it, right? Because they can't get around this. And Revelation 22, let me know what their response was. They can't get around this. Now, to further prove it's Jehovah personally showing up on earth. He's showing up on earth. It even tells us when Jehovah shows up, where will he make his residence during that time? First, let's read verse 9. Man, I hate coffee stained teeth. Wow, too much coffee. Verse 9. Revelation 14, I'm sorry, Zechariah 14, verse 9. Same book, Zechariah 14, verse 9. And Jehovah will be king over all the earth. And that day, Jehovah will be one and his name one. Jehovah will be the only king reigning over the entire earth on that day. And where will he be reigning from? Same chapter, Zechariah 14, verses 16 and 17. Same chapter, Zechariah 14, verses 16 and 17. Watch here. Watch here. Read with me. 16 and 17. Everyone who is left remaining out of all the nations that come against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to bow down to the king, Jehovah of armies, and to celebrate the festival of booths. Now notice 17. But if anyone among the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem, notice the location on earth, to bow down to the king, Jehovah of armies, no rain will fall on them. Notice the surviving nations, those who did not go up with the armies of the nations and made an embankment against Jerusalem. Armies, which Zechariah 14 says, were killed instantaneously by a blast from the presence of Jehovah. Those who remain behind in those nations... Representatives of those nations will be required to go once a year to Jerusalem because there they will see Jehovah, the king, and bow to him there. So notice Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah will personally come down to the Mount of Olives. His feet will personally touch the Mount of Olives, splitting it physically in half. And then Jehovah will personally take up residence in Jerusalem and representatives of the nations will have to go there once a year to worship Jehovah face to face. And Jehovah will come with his holy ones. Clear? Now, do you know why you cannot allegorize the feet of Jehovah? You can't say that Jehovah's feet 
They're not literally feet. He doesn't literally have feet. You can't allegorize that. But that Zechariah is seeing Jehovah in an actual body of some sort that actually has feet. And you can't allegorize it and explain it away. Because it says the Mount of Olives will be physically split at the impact of his feet. Since the splitting of the Mount is literal and actual, that means the cause of the splitting has to be actual as well. You with me there? They can say it's symbolic, Revelation 22, 13. But notice why it can't be symbolic. Notice it says the mount will be split. So that's an actual physical splitting of the mount. Caused by what? Metaphorical feet? Really? Metaphorical symbolic feet will split the mount physically in half. And so Jehovah won't be physically in Jerusalem, which means that when Jehovah requires the nations to go to Jerusalem to bow to him, they're bowing to no one because he's not there. It's symbolic. Yes, Jesus Christus, my Lord and God. This will take place during the millennial reign of Christ on earth where he rules from Jerusalem. So Revelation 22, 13. Ask them. When the mount is split in half, is that symbolic or actual? Ask them, if it's symbolic, why are the nations required to go to Jerusalem and bow to Jehovah there? He isn't there. It's only symbolic. So why even go there to bow to him? You see why the symbolic interpretation won't work, Revelation 22 and Medic, and the rest of you. What's the significance of going up to Jerusalem once a year to bow down to Jehovah if Jehovah isn't there and Jehovah's omnipresent? You can bow to him anywhere you're at. This only makes sense if Jehovah's actually there personally, physically, which accounts for why the mount could be split in half by the feet of Jehovah, feet that are not symbolic but material and physical. You see why you can't explain it away. Is it sinking into everyone? Why you cannot allegorize this passage? You can't. Remember what I said yesterday in yesterday's session. No anti-Trinitarian will be able to refute your arguments on the basis of an honest, accurate interpretation of these texts. Notice I said, yeah, they can say whatever they want. I'm talking about being honest to the text and handling the text accurately. Your arguments are irrefutable. Because you're on the side of the truth of Scripture. You don't need to pervert Scripture to make it agree with your theology. That's why the church was forced to adopt the doctrine of the Trinity. Clear? Revelation 22, did it make sense to, for you as well? Before I connected with Jesus our Lord. Do you want to make Revelation 22 see? I want to make sure he got it. Because he's not responding. I don't know what happened. Did he leave me behind? Got raptured? Okay. Now, how does this prove that Jesus is God? Pay attention. Jehovah comes out and descends to the Mount of Olives. He will descend on the Mount of Olives and his feet splits it in half. Jehovah will rule as king in Jerusalem and the families of the earth have to go see him there to worship him. And Jehovah is coming with his holy ones. The Hebrew word kadoshim can also be rendered as saints. Now let's see how this proves that Jesus is Jehovah God. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. We're using Jehovah Witness Bible. Okay. After he had said these things, while they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud caught him up from their sight. So notice, Jesus enters a cloud, disappears. And as they were gazing into the sky, sky while he was on his way, suddenly two men in white garments stood beside them. Now notice what they say in 11. And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? 
This Jesus who was taken up from you into the sky will come in the same manner as you have seen him going into the sky. The way he left, he left physically entered a cloud, disappeared in cloud. Expect the day in which a cloud will show up and he'll come out of the cloud. So the only difference is he went up in a cloud. When he comes, he'll come down out of a cloud. But now notice where he lifted up from to enter the cloud. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from a mountain called the Mount of Olives. So Jesus left from the Mount of Olives, entered a cloud, disappeared. And then the angel said, that's how he's going to come back. So he's going to come back in a cloud and descend from the cloud to the Mount of Olives. He left from the Mount of Olives and he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. But when he comes back, will he be alone? First Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. So that he may make your hearts firm, blameless in holiness before God and Father, at the presence of our Lord Jesus with all his holy ones. <whistles> wow. Wait, Zechariah 14, verse 5 says, Jehovah my God will come with all his holy ones. Paul says it's our Lord Jesus Christ who's coming with his holy ones. You caught it? But you didn't catch how subtle the perversion of their translation is. You didn't catch how subtle the perversion of their translation is. Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah's feet will touch the Mount of Olives split in half. Acts 1 says, Jesus left from the Mount of Olives, will return to the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah, Zechariah's God is coming with his holy ones. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13 says, it's our Lord Jesus Christ who's coming with his holy ones. Hmm. But you didn't catch the subtle perversion by the Jehovah's Witnesses. Notice it didn't say at the coming of our Lord Jesus. It says at the presence of our Lord Jesus. They re routinely, routinely mistranslate the Greek words referring to Jesus' return, his coming, as presence because they don't believe Jesus comes back visibly. His presence will be manifested, but it's not visible. We will know he comes by the effects, not because we will see him with our eyes. And so they don't render the Greek as the coming of our Lord Jesus, but at the presence of our Lord Jesus. You see how subtle the perversion is? It's so subtle you didn't catch it. You see? Quote it again. 1 Thessalonians 3.13. You see how perverted of a Bible this is? Notice, at the presence of our Lord Jesus with all his holy ones. Now compare that to the King James Version. You see how subtle the perversion is? Because they believe you will know that he's present by the effects. But you won't know that he's present by seeing him visibly. Notice the difference with the, the King James, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. At the coming of our Lord Jesus. They didn't render it as coming. They rendered it as at the presence of our Lord Jesus. Wow. You caught it? Of course you're not going to notice it, Jason. Because you haven't been indoctrinated, brainwashed. You interpreted the presence of our Lord Jesus to mean his visible presence. That we will see his presence when he returns visibly in his glorified physical body. But when you get a Jehovah's Witness teaching you the Bible is going to say, you notice it says presence. Because Jesus will never return visibly. We won't see him visibly. But his presence will be made known to us. When he destroys the nations at Armageddon, but he'll remain invisible to us. So this Bible 
was diabolically produced to mislead people from the true God and the true nature of Jesus' return. Doesn't it upset you that there's a Bible out there produced by a particular cult group that deliberately mistranslates core doctrines, core passages of the Bible to mislead their followers from discovering the true God and the true nature of Jesus' return? Yes, Irene. Irene, if you don't know what Joe's Witnesses believe, let me quickly share with you what they believe. They believe that when Jesus the man died, his body was disposed of, he ceased to exist, and that Jehovah then recreated the archangel Michael with the memories of the earthly Jesus, but the man Jesus no longer exists. The archangel Michael was recreated in the place of the man Jesus, with the memories of the earthly Jesus. So there is no Jesus anymore. It's the Archangel Michael with the memories of Jesus. Okay, let me explain the belief of Joe's Witnesses again. I know it's going to be confusing. They believe... The first creature of Jehovah is the Archangel Michael. The Archangel Michael. That Archangel Michael didn't become flesh, didn't become man. That Archangel Michael ceased to exist. The memories of that Archangel Michael and his life force was transferred over into Mary's womb. When Mary conceived that baby, that human baby wasn't an angelic human. He was only a human baby with the memories and the life force of the Archangel Michael, who no longer existed during the time that the man Jesus existed on earth. Okay, clear? What they believe so far? Then they believe that when Jesus died, because remember, Joe's Witnesses believe when you die, you cease to exist. They don't even call it soul sleep. They believe when you die, you cease to exist, and you only exist as a memory in the thought of Jehovah. Jehovah keeps you in his memory. So then, at the end, Jehovah then can recreate you or keep you in a state of non-existence. So when the man Jesus died... He ceased to exist. He was annihilated. So then what did Jehovah do? Recreate that archangel Michael and then implanted in Michael the memories of the historical Jesus. So when they refer to Jesus, they don't believe Jesus exists. They believe the archangel Michael exists in the place of Jesus and Michael has the memories of the Jesus that was on earth. But there's no continuity between the two. So they're either lying to you when they say they believe in Jesus or they don't even know what their society teaches about the historical Jesus. He doesn't exist anymore. Did you know that? So you thought that the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was resurrected. No. They use the same language but define it differently. And that's the cunning of the, of the serpent, of the devil. The devil will use your language but redefine your language to make it mean something other than you've come to expect it to mean. That's the brainwashing of the devil. Right? So the Jehovah's Witness says, God raised Jesus. And you say, yes. But then you say, wait, what do you mean God resurrected Jesus? We mean that the man Jesus ceased to exist and Jehovah recreated the archangel Michael in his place with the memories of the historical Jesus. That's not a resurrection. And you know what they believe? That the archangel Michael then assumed a body that resembled the Jesus of, on earth but it wasn't an actual physical body, and he wasn't actually Jesus. 
He only appeared that way to convince the disciples that Jesus had been raised. In other words, it's a form of deception similar to what Muslims believe. Is it sinking in? What they believe? Is it sinking in what they believe? They do not believe in Jesus' physical resurrection. Okay? They don't believe it. And by the way, please, I don't want any of you to take my word for it. When a Jehovah Witness knocks on your door and say, hey, the man Jesus, was he raised physically in that physical body glorified? They'll say no. The body <clears throat> deteriorated. They believe that Jehovah disposed of the body. So what happened? The archangel Michael came back into being with the memories of the earthly Jesus. So there is no Jesus in heaven anymore. A sharp Jehovah Witness medic will tell you this. When the Bible says Jesus appeared to them in a body of flesh and bone, that wasn't actually Jesus' physical body resurrected. It was a body that the archangel Michael assumed to convince them he was raised alive. It was a body, he assumed. Like angels in the Old Testament can assume human bodies, but they're not human by nature, and they don't actually have physical bodies, human bodies. That's what Michael did after the so-called resurrection. Yes, first and last. First, you start with the Archangel Michael. Then he ceased to exist, and the human Jesus came into being in his place with the memories and life force of the Archangel Michael. Then the historical Jesus ceased to exist. Michael was recreated with the memories of the historical Jesus. Making sense to everyone what they believe? They don't have your Jesus. They don't have your Jehovah. They don't have your spirit. They don't have the same understanding of resurrection that you do. And they don't have your gospel. It's another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. It's another satanic counterfeit. In fact, let me confuse you a little more. The Jehovah of the Jehovah Witnesses has a spirit body. A spirit body that he's bound to from all eternity. And so the Jehovah of the Jehovah Witnesses is a spirit being with a spirit body. And so he himself is not omnipresent. What it is is that his active force, the Holy Spirit, is present everywhere. And by means of that active force, he's aware of what takes place. But Jehovah God the Father has a spirit body, a spirit body that binds him to time, space, and place. Do you know that? I want it to sink in. To them, Jehovah is God the Father. But God the Father has a spirit body. He's not bodiless, shapeless, immaterial. No, he has a spirit body, an actual spiritual body. So that because he has a spiritual body, he himself cannot be personally present everywhere. So by means of the Holy Spirit, who is not a person to them, but Jehovah's active force, like oxygen fills the earth, Jehovah's active force fills the creation, and by means of that active force, he becomes aware of what takes place on earth. <laughs> yeah, Protestant believer. The ganja. Okay. So now you understand more properly what they believe and don't believe, right? So do you see now why they rendered 1 Thessalonians 3.13 as at the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ones? Because they don't believe in a visible coming of Jesus Christ. They don't. They don't. But with that said, 
you still can show them that according to Zechariah 14, it is Jehovah God that comes down with his glorious feet, touching the Mount of Olives, splitting in half, and takes up actual residence in Jerusalem as the king of the earth. And the families of the earth have to go see him there and worship him as Jehovah comes with his holy ones. The New Testament says, Jesus left from the Mount of Olives in a cloud, will come back the way he left to the Mount of Olives, which means it's Jesus' feet that touch the Mount of Olives, and he's coming with his holy ones, which means that Jesus is the Jehovah God that Zechariah said is coming to the Mount of Olives to reign in Jerusalem. Clear? And that's their Bible. Now let's use their Bible again to further prove that Jesus is Jehovah God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. This, this is their Bible, by the way. This is a proof of the righteous judgment of God, leading to, you, to your being counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are indeed suffering. This takes into account that it is righteous on God's part to repay tribulation to those who make tribulation for you. Pay attention now. But you who suffer tribulation will be given relief along with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels. So notice, it's the Lord Jesus who will be revealed from heaven with his powerful angels. He's the one coming to destroy the wicked. Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah is coming with his holy ones to destroy the wicked armies of the nations. But here Paul says, that's what Jesus is going to do. Now pay attention to verse 9. 8 and 9 again. 8 and 9. Revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven with his powerful angels. Notice 8 and 9. In a flaming fire. So our Lord Jesus appears in flaming fire. As he brings vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the good news about our Lord Jesus. These very ones will undergo the judicial punishment of everlasting de destruction from before the Lord and from the glory of his strength. At the time when he comes to be glorified in connection with his holy ones and to be regarded in that day with wonder among those who exercise faith because the witness we gave met with faith among you. Notice. Who's going to be revealed from heaven? The Lord Jesus Christ with his powerful angels with flaming fire that he will use to destroy the wicked with everlasting destruction, right? Right? But let's compare that to Isaiah 66 verses 15 to 16. Isaiah 66 verses 15 to 16. Let's see if you connect the language with what Paul says about the Lord Jesus Christ. For Jehovah will come as a fire, and his chariots are like a storm wind to repay in furious, furious anger, to rebuke with flames of fire. Wow. For with fire, Jehovah will execute judgment. Yes, with his sword against all flesh, and the slain of Jehovah will be many. Guys, I'm confused. Second Thessalonians 1 said, the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with flame of fire to destroy his enemies with everlasting destruction as he comes with his powerful angels. Isaiah 66, 15 to 16 says, Jehovah is coming as fire, right? And will rebuke with flames of fire. Did you catch it? Pun intended, fired up. Pun intended. So even in their Bible, Jehovah does what the New Testament says Jesus will do. Jehovah comes as fire and will destroy the wicked with flames of fire. Will come with his holy ones to destroy the armies of the nations. He will land on the Mount of Olives and his feet will split the Mount of Olives and take up precedence in Jerusalem. All of which we just read about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus comes with his holy ones. He comes back to the Mount of Olives from where he left. And he will destroy his enemies with everlasting destruction in flames of fire. Right? 
right? And now we're going to segue into the Quran in a minute, if you guys want me to, unless you want me to open up Q&A. But I'll show you how you can use the Quran to prove that Jesus is eternal and divine. Two birds, one stone, if you're interested. Now, Isaiah 40, verse 10. Isaiah 40, verse 10. I'm showing you what passage is to quote from the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Trinity and that Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. Look, the Sovereign Lord Jehovah will come with power. The Sovereign Lord Jehovah will come with power and his arm will rule for him. Look, his reward is with him and the wage he pays is before him. So the Sovereign Lord Jehovah is coming with his reward. And he will repay people for what they've earned, right? Isaiah 62, 11. Isaiah 62, 11. Watch here. Isaiah 62, 11. Look, Jehovah has proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, look, your salvation is coming. Look. His reward is with him, and the wage he pays is before him. So Jehovah Zion's salvation is coming. What is reward to repay people to what they've earned? Psalm 62, 12. Psalm 62, 12. Tell me this book is not supernatural. It's not amazing. It's not mind-blowing. Psalm 62, 12. Also, loyal love is yours, O Jehovah, for you will repay... Each one according to his deeds. Proverbs 24, 12. I'm showing you what verses to use from the Bible and what verses to avoid. Okay. Proverbs 24, 12. If you say, but we did not know about this, does not the one who examines hearts discern it? Yes, the one who watches you will know. And we'll repay each man according to his activity. Okay. Let's see what Jesus Christ our Lord says about himself. Matthew 16, 27. Matthew 16, 27. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father. So here's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man who's coming in the glory of his Father. So here Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man and the Son of God. Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. So the angels belong to the Son of Man, the Son of God. And then he will repay each one according to his behavior. Jesus, what in the world are you talking about? Why are you claiming to do what these Old Testament texts state Jehovah will do, not someone else? Why are you doing what Psalm 62, 12, Isaiah 40, verse 10, Isaiah 62, 11, Proverbs 24, 12, state Jehovah does and not someone else? Who do you think you are, Jesus? And notice he's not the father, but the father's son, who's the son of man. Is it sinking in or no? Before I move on, Jeremiah 17, verse 10. This came up yesterday, but we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's Spirit. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Watch this. I, Jehovah, not some creature. I, Jehovah, am searching the heart, examining the innermost thoughts, to give to each one according to his ways, according to the fruitage of his works. So Jehovah searches hearts, examines the innermost thoughts, so that Jehovah will then give to each one according to his ways, according to what he's earned. Jehovah does this, not someone else. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, and skip to 23. Revelation 2, verse 18 and 23 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Revelation 2, verse 18 and 23 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Watch here. To the angel of the congregation of Thyatira write, 
These are the things that the Son of God says. So notice who the speaker is. The Son of God is speaking. The one who has eyes like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine copper. The Son of God says in verse 23, I will kill her children with deadly plague so that all the congregations will know that I am the one who searches the innermost thoughts and hearts and I will give to you individually according to your deeds. Who do you think you are, son of God? You just took the words of Jehovah and Jeremiah 17.10 and applied it to yourself. How could you do that, son of God? The Jehovah's Witnesses tell me, you're the Archangel Michael, you're not Jehovah. Hmm. You caught it? Did you catch it? Jehovah 17.10 says, I, Jehovah, am searching the hearts and testing the innermost thoughts to repay people according to their works. The Son of God says, when I kill these blasphemers, idolaters with deadly plagues, then all the churches know that I am that one who searches hearts and innermost thoughts to repay each one according to their work. Why is Jesus speaking as if he's Jehovah God of the Old Testament in the Jehovah Witness Bible. For those of you who have eyes to see and ears to hear, because of the Holy Spirit enabling you to see who God is and accepting his word for what it is, do you see how irrefutable the evidence is? Jesus is Jehovah, and yet he's not the Father, he's not the Spirit, because Jehovah is triune. It's irrefutable, folks. You can't get around it. Final one for the Jehovah Witness. Final one. Final one. All right. Thank you, brother. He's been taking notes. God bless you, Jeremy. And embolden you and fill you for his glory. Fill every one of us for the glory of Jesus and save us. Save my daughters, Lord. Bring them to me, please. Please, God. Please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit. Final one for the Jehovah Witness. Final one. 1 Kings 8, 39. 1 Kings 8, 39. Only with the help of the Holy Spirit, who himself is Jehovah God. Which, by the way, brings me up to answering a question that Andrew asked. I'm going to answer the question for Andrew in a minute. Okay. Read with me. 1 Kings 8, 39. Pay attention. Then may you hear from the heavens. Solomon praying to Jehovah. Then may you hear from the heavens, your dwelling place. And may you forgive... And take action and reward each one according to all his ways. For you know his heart. You alone truly know every human heart. So notice, Jehovah forgives and he alone knows all the hearts of human beings. The children of men, right? Did you catch it? He forgives and Jehovah alone knows the hearts of all humans. The hearts of all the sons of men, right? Not someone else but Jehovah, right? Isaiah 44, 21. Isaiah 44, 21. You know where I'm going with this, Protestant believer. You know where I'm going with this. Watch here. Psalm 44, 21, not Isaiah. If I said Isaiah, I'm sorry. Psalm 44, 21. Yeah, see, I don't know why. I was thinking of Isaiah. Psalm 44, 21. Sorry about that. Psalm 44, 21. Lord, protect me from here. And from sin. Jesus. Will not God discover this? He is aware of the secrets of the heart. So God is aware of the secrets of the heart. And he alone knows the hearts of all the sons of men. Okay, Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Guys, get ready to be blown away. Because what I'm about to show you, what I'm about to show you, can be used for Joe's witnesses, for Unitarians who think they're Christians, and for Muslims. Watch. Let me praise Jehovah. Let everything within me praise his holy name. Let me praise Jehovah. May I never forget all that he has done. He forgives all your errors. Jehovah forgives all your sins and heals all your ailments. He reclaims your life from the pit and crowns you with his loyal love and mercy. So notice why I should praise Jehovah. 
Not only because he's God, because he forgives us all our sins, our errors, and heals us of all our diseases, all our ailments, and redeems us from the pit. Right? Let's see who Jesus is. Mark 2, the first of the Gospels, or so critical scholar, scholarship will tell us. Mark 2, verses 5 to 12 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Jehovah alone knows all the hearts of the sons of men. He knows the secrets of the hearts. He forgives all our sins, our errors, and heals all our diseases, our ailments. Notice what Jesus does. Mark 2, 5 to 12. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were there sitting and reasoning in their hearts. Notice they weren't thinking this aloud. They were thinking this in their hearts, in the secrets of their hearts. Pay attention. Right? Pay attention. Verse 6 again. Notice. Now some of the scribes were there sitting and reasoning in their hearts. Why is this man talking this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except one God? Except one. That is God. Notice verse 8. But immediately Jesus discerned by his spirit that they are reasoning that way among themselves. So he said to them, why are you reasoning these things in your hearts? Immediately he knew what was in their hearts. Immediately. Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and pick up your stretcher and walk. Now notice what he does. Notice what he does. But in order for you, to, for you to know that the Son of Man, I, the Son of Man, has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go your, to, your, to your home. And that he got up and immediately picked up his stretcher and walked out in front of them all. So they were all astonished, and they glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So wait, Jesus knew what was in the hearts of these men. He knew the secrets of their heart. Jesus healed the man's disease and forgave him his errors, forgave him his sins. But wait, wait. Jehovah is the one who forgives our errors, our sins. He forgives from heaven. Jehovah alone knows the secrets of hearts, what's in the hearts of all the sons of men. And we are to praise Jehovah for forgiving our errors, our sins, and healing our diseases, our ailments, all of which Jesus just did in the earliest of the four Gospels, according to critical scholarship. But I thought Mark doesn't depict Jesus as Jehovah. Why, when, why am? And you're still not getting it. Jehovah is deifying a creature, ascribing to a creature the abilities that the Old Testament says belong to Jehovah alone, blurring the distinction between the creator and the creature. Right? But you missed something that was very subtle. Mark 2, verse 8. Here, Mark affirms the two natures of Christ, but you have to pay attention. Mark 2, verse 8. Mark 2, verse 8. But immediately, Jesus, discerning by his spirit that they were reasoning that way among themselves. This is Mark's way of affirming the deity of Christ. Notice it was by virtue of his spirit. This is Mark's way of saying... Jesus knew by virtue of his deity, in respect to his divine nature, he knew what they were thinking in their hearts. We don't expect Mark to use later categories of expression to refer to the two natures of Christ. In other words, I don't expect Mark to say, Jesus knew by virtue of his div divinity, his deity. Mark is communicating the same truths that later centuries of Christians would, would use to affirm the two natures of Christ, but Mark is using his own categories, his own ways of expressing the fact that Christ knew in respect to his deity. By virtue of his spirit, i.e. his divine nature, he knew what they were thinking in their hearts. Okay. Again, we have a moron not listening to me. 
Joshua, I'm going to try this again. Since the Old Testament says Jehovah alone knows the hearts of men and forgives sins, why is Jehovah deifying a creature, ascribing to a creature the unique prerogatives, abilities of Jehovah God, thereby blurring the distinction between creator and creature? And why does Jehovah forgive for the sake of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, when the Old Testament says Jehovah forgives for his sake alone, and on the basis of his name alone. So again, I'm going to educate this moron. Show me in the Old Testament where Jehovah forgives for the sake of someone else on the basis of some other name, not for his sake, not on the basis of his name. And show me in the Old Testament where a creature says, I have authority on earth to forgive your sins. Let's try this again. I know you're pretending to be listening and refuting me. For Jehovah to then give such power to a creature means the New Testament is in contradiction with the Old Testament because he's now deifying a creature, something that Jehovah does not do, especially in the Old Testament. Stop trying to be stupid, pretend you're intelligent, and address my actual objection because I'm going to humiliate you. No, you don't tell me it wasn't revealed on the New Testament because the New Testament has to be consistent with the Old Testament. It cannot contradict it, you moron. Let's try it again. Show me in the Old Testament where the Old Testament prophets who prophesied the coming of Messiah says that Jehovah God will forgive uh, for the sake of someone other on the basis of someone else's name, not his own. Final chance, moron. See, you see why I despise these dogs of Satan, these children of the devil? Because they think they're smart. They think they're refuting something, only embarrassing themselves. And this is why I go for the juggler. Quote a Hebrew passage where Jehovah forgives for the sake of someone else's name and where you find an inspired emissary of Jehovah saying, I have the power to forgive sins on earth. Final chance. Okay. Since you can't refute me, stop interjecting. Sit here and listen with the hopes that the Spirit will convict you to repent of your blasphemy and stupidity, or you're going to get blocked. Okay. You see why, why M... How you refute a Jehovah Witness who uses the argument that this moron used? Okay. Now let me show you in the Old Testament. Jehovah forgives for the sake of no one and for no one else's name but his own. Are you ready? Are you ready? So I can further prove that Jesus is Jehovah God. Are you ready? So I'm going to have to now elaborate this. Nowhere in the Old Testament will you find Jehovah forgiving for the sake of someone else's name or allowing a creature the power to forgive sins on earth. Okay? You ready? Psalm 25, 11. Psalm 25, 11. Yes, Liam Kincaid in Pal Talk. I'm live and there are people interacting with me. And if you happen to be an agent of Satan trying to pervert scripture, I will also go for your juggler. Okay, Psalm 25, 11. For the sake of your name, O Jehovah, forgive my error, though it is great. For whose name's sake? Jehovah's name. Psalm 54, verse 1. Psalm 54, verse 1. Watch, guys. Further proof that Jesus is the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. What the Old Testament says about Jehovah, the New Testament says about Jesus. Pay attention. Oh God, save me by your name and defend me with your power. Oh God, save me by the name of Moses or Gabriel. Okay. Psalm 7838. Psalm 7838. Folks, if you learn these arguments, I promise you, 
you will be irrefutable by the grace of the triune God. I promise you. Psalm 78, 38. Watch here. But he was merciful. He would forgive their error and not bring them to ruin. He often held back his anger instead of stirring up all his wrath. For the sake of his mercy, he forgave their error. Psalm 79, 9. Psalm 79, 9. Psalm 79, 9. All from the Jehovah Witness Bible. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the sake of your glorious name. Rescue us and forgives, forgive us our sins for the sake of your name. Did you see it? For, the na for your name's sake, Jehovah, for the sake of your glorious name, because of your name, because of your mercy, forgive us. Does he forgive for the sake of someone else's name? Isaiah 43, 25. Jesus Christos, my Lord and my God. Let me take a moment to address this because people keep asking me. How am I able to recall these passages? All honest truth, honest to God, it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. I never tried to memorize scripture, but early on I realized that I was able to recall these passages when people asked me, and I knew that's the Holy Spirit. Another sign of the Holy Spirit's miraculous gifting of the body of Christ. This is truly a work of the Holy Spirit. He gets the glory, has nothing to do with me. Pray he perfects it in me for the glory of Jesus. And let me tell you when it doesn't work. If you're trying to test me, say, okay, here, I'm going to test you. What does this passage say? I can't do it. It has to be in an actual teaching session where you ask me a question and then the Holy Spirit brings to my mind all of these passages. But if you're putting me on the spot, say, oh, I'm going to test you, won't work because that's not how this gift works. Okay? So I'm being honest to God. This is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and I thank him for this gift because it's a sign, number one, that he loves us. He loves me. I belong to him. Number two, that he's more real than we can imagine. And it makes it easier for me to then teach and debate. Okay, now, Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 43, 25. I am the one who's blotting out your transgressions for my own sake. No, no, no. For the sake of Moses. For the sake of Gabriel. No, no. For my own sake. For my name. Because of my name. For my own sake. Right? Okay, now here's where I'm going to get confused. Notice what Jesus says in Luke 24, 47. Luke 24, 47. Luke 24, 47. And on the basis of his name, Jesus speaking. Jesus is speaking. So you know that Jesus speaking. Let's add 46 as well. I don't want people to think it's not Jesus. 46. Notice what Jesus says. 46. See, Alex, Alex Gaskin, it sunk in, didn't it? And he said to them, this is what is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise from among the dead on the third day, and on the basis of his name, the name of Christ, repentance for forgiveness of sins would be preached in all nations, starting out from Jerusalem. Wait, 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 Jesus. Wait, 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 wait. What are you doing? What are you doing? The Old Testament says it's on the basis of the name of Jehovah, for the sake of Jehovah's name, that repentance and forgiveness are granted. Why now are you changing things, Jesus? Why are you saying now forgiveness and repentance are granted for your name's sake because of your name? Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Watch here. Peter said to them, repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. Whoa. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, free gift of the, of the Holy Spirit. Wait, 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 wait. What? 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 Peter, what did you just? Peter, you're a Jew. You know the Old Testament. Why did you say 
that we have to repent and then be baptized for the sake of Jesus, on behalf of Jesus, <clears throat> on the authority of Jesus' name, to be forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you know the Old Testament, Peter, we're forgiven, we're saved, we're given the gift of the Spirit for the sake of the name of Jehovah. Acts 10, 43. 40, well, let's read Acts 10. Let's read Acts 10, 39 to 43. So we know who Peter's talking about. Acts 10, 39 to 43. And we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the country of the Jews and Jerusalem. But they did away with him by hanging him on a stake. God raised this one up on the third day and allowed him to become manifest, not to all the people, but to witnesses appointed beforehand by God to us, who ate and drank with him after his rising from the dead. Also, he ordered us to preach to the people and to give a thorough witness that this is the one decreed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone putting faith in him receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Through whose name? Yeah, I'm convinced the Shroud of Turin is a miraculous artifact of the Triumph God. It is the Shroud of Jesus, preserved as a witness to silence critics. Plenty of evidence for it. But anyway, you see, not only did they do things, forgave in the name of Jesus, they even did miracles in the name of Jesus. Go to Mark 9, 38 to 39. Mark 9, 38 to 39. Well, unless the Lord Jesus intervenes November 20th, I may not be doing these sessions for a while because that wicked, filthy judge may hold me in contempt and get me thrown in jail. Can you beg God for miraculous protection against that? That it does not happen? Mark 9, 38 to 39. Watch here. John said to him, teacher, we saw someone expelling demons by using your name. Here's my challenge to you, anti-Trinitarian heretics and agents of Satan. Show me a single place in the Hebrew Bible where the true men and women of God did miracles in the name of someone other than Jehovah. As long as she wants to, medic. Teacher, we saw someone expelling demons by using your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not try to prevent him, for there is no one who will do a powerful work on the basis of my name, who will quickly be able to say anything bad about me. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Your name? People do miracles? Your name? They destroy the power of Satan? Your name? Forgiveness of sins is granted? Your name? The Holy Spirit is given? Your name? But I just read the Old Testament. It's the name of Jehovah and Jehovah's name that does miracles, that grants salvation and forgiveness and healing. Luke 9, 49 to 50. I may have to do another session on Jesus as God in the Quran. So thank that, that heretic for bringing this objection, because now I showed why M and Medic how to refute the assertion that Jehovah gave this creature this power. Luke 9, 49 to 50. In response, John said, Instructor, we saw someone expelling demons by using your name, parallel to Mark, but I want to use Luke as well. And we tried to prevent him because he's not following uh, with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not prevent, try to prevent him. Forever is not against you, is for you. Mark 10, 17. In Jesus' name, I will. The triumph God will save me. Luke 10, 17. Amen, amen, king of kings, I receive it. I said Mark, right? Because I keep thinking Mark and, and Luke. Luke 10, 17. But notice I catch myself and correct myself, Protestant. So here, I got you. Luke 10, 17. Then the 70 retor returned with joy. Retoined. Retoined. <laughs> the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are made subject to us by the use of your name. 
Your name, Lord? Your name? Yep. Your name. Hmm. 1 John 2, verse 12. 1 John 2, verse 12. This is going to blow you away. I'm going to put the icing on the cake. This is going to blow you away, right? Right after 1 John 2, 12. I am writing you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for the sake of his name. In the context, if you read from verse 1, it's, it's Jesus' name. John is saying, you've been forgiven for the sake of Jesus' name. If you start at verse 1, the name here is the name of Jesus. Why is John a monotheist? Why is Peter a monotheist? Why is Mark a monotheist? Why is Paul a monotheist saying the name of Jesus, Jesus' name, brings forgiveness of sin, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and heals all your ailments? When the Old Testament says that's all to be done on the basis of the name of Jehovah for the sake of Jehovah. Acts 9, 33 to 34. Acts 9, 33, 33, 35. Acts 9, 33 to 35. The key verse is 34. Then he found a man named Aeneas who had been lying flat on his bed for eight years for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. What? Rise and make up your bed. And he got up immediately. When all those living in Lydda and the plain of Sharon saw him, they turned to the Lord. What? He didn't say, Aeneas, Aeneas, Jehovah heals you? Jesus Christ heals you? Peter, what are you talking about? Jesus is not on earth and in is in heaven. How dare you invoke someone other than Jehovah in heaven to do this healing and then get results, get the man healed? Because Jesus is not someone other than Jehovah. He is Jehovah in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. Really? Acts 16, verses 16 to 18. Acts 16, verses 16 to 18. Read here. Now it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a servant girl with a spirit, a demon of divination, met us. She supplied her masters with much profit by fortune telling. This girl kept following Paul and us and crying out with the words, These men are slaves of the Most High God and are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. Finally, Paul got tired of it and turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. In the name of who? In the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm really confused. Psalm 25, 11. Psalm 54, 1. Psalm 99, 9. Along with Psalm 30, 78, 38. Isaiah 43, 25. All stated, Jehovah forgives and pardons and heals because of his mercy for the sake of his name, his glorious name, not for the sake of someone else's name. Now, here's the granddaddy of them all. The granddaddy of them all. Isaiah 45, 21 to 23. Isaiah 45, 21 to 23. Isaiah 45, 21 to 23. Let's see if it's going to make sense. Make your report present. Uh, make your report. Present your case. Pay attention. Jehovah speaking. Let them consult together in unity. Who foretold this long ago and who declared it from times past? Is it not I, Jehovah? There is no God but me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no one else. Now understand what he's saying. He's saying to all the nations of the earth, since there is no other God who can save, there's only one God who can save, then you need to turn to me and me alone, all of you, because there is no other God that can save you. So you shouldn't turn to anyone else but me. So all the ends of the earth, all the nations of the earth, you need to turn to me and be saved. Salvation is found in me alone. Okay. Now 23, notice what he's going to say. 23. 
By myself I have sworn, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. It will not return to me every knee will bend, every tongue will swear loyalty. I have sworn the time will come and this will happen. Every knee and tongue will swear allegiance to me. Okay. Acts 4. Now, before we read it, the apostles Peter and John healed a paralytic, a paralyzed man in the name of Jesus Christ, and he was healed instantaneously. This caught the attention of the religious authorities who then imprisoned them and asked them, by what power, by what authority, by what name did you do this miracle? Now let's go to Acts 4, verses 5 to 14 to see their answer. Acts 4, verses 5 to 14 to see their answer in the Jehovah Witness Bible. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. Watch here. Watch what's going to happen. Along with Annas, the chief priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all who were relatives of the chief priests, they stood Peter and John in their midst and began to question them. Notice what they're asking. By what power or in whose name did you do this, this miracle? Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now fills him and emboldens, emboldens him to speak without fear. Right? Then Peter and John stood in their midst. Again, what power in whose name did you do this? Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the, of, the, of the people and elders, rulers of the people and elders, Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue for the glory of Christ. If we are being examined today about a good deed to a crippled man, and you want to know who made this man well, notice, who made him well? Pay attention. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you executed on a stake, but whom God raised up from the dead by means of him. The, this man stands here healthy in front of you. This is the stone, Jesus, that was treated by you builders as of no account that has become the chief cornerstone. Now notice what he says in light of what you read in Isaiah 45. Furthermore, there is no salvation in anyone else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men which we must get saved. What in the world are you saying, Peter? You just read Isaiah 45, 21, 22. There is no other God who saves. Only Jehovah is a righteous Savior, which is why all the ends of the earth must turn to Jehovah to be saved. Peter says the only name in heaven, the only name under heaven that can save is the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. But now let's read 13 and 14. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. 13 and 14. Watch here. Now when they saw the outspokenness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated. They were they didn't receive any formal theological training. Any formal theological training. That's what it means uneducated. They're not educated in the rabbinic schools. And ordinary men, they were astonished. And they began to realize that they had been with Jesus. What a powerful statement. I'll come back to that in a minute. But notice why they couldn't refute them. Notice 14, why they couldn't say, liars! As they were looking at the man who had been cured standing with them, they had nothing to say in answer to this. You think? Here's the man whom they knew to be paralyzed, had been healed miraculously. He's standing right there as proof. Jesus the Nazarene healed him when we invoked his name. As proof to you Jews, he's the only name that can save anyone. But now wait. Peter, you're a Jew. John, you're a Jew. You know the Old Testament. You know the Old Testament. Jehovah alone saves. His name alone saves. His name alone forgives. His name alone heals. In fact, Jehovah says, because there is no right other, there is no righteous Savior besides him. That's why all the inhabitants of the earth have to turn to him to be saved. But Peter, you just said, filled with the Holy Spirit. No less. The Holy Spirit just filled you to say Jesus' name is the only name 
In all the earth, under heaven, that saves. There is no other name. But Peter, if Jesus is not Jehovah, you just made the name of a creature greater than, mightier than the name of Jehovah, if he's a creature. You understand what he just said? If there is no name under heaven in all the earth that can save and heal, but the name of Jesus, and Jesus is a creature, that means the name of a creature is greater than the name of Jehovah, and it's not Jehovah's name that saves, but the name of this creature, making him greater than Jehovah. Jehovah's Witnesses, you got problems. Acts 4.12, one more time. Acts 4.12, one more time. Jehovah's Witnesses, you got problems. In their translation, read it again. Read it again. Furthermore, there is no salvation in anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must get saved. Jehovah's Witnesses, this Bible, even your Bible, is a nightmare for you. It proves that you are sons of the devil if you don't repent. You're telling me Jesus is the Archangel Michael. He's not Jehovah. How can the name of a creature be the only name under heaven and all the earth that can save in light of the Old Testament without this meaning that the name of, the, of a creature has supplanted the name of Jehovah the name of a creature has become greater and mightier than the name of Jehovah. In fact, King of Kings, Joe's witnesses are more dangerous than Muslims. Why? Because it is easier to fall for the snare of a Joe witness who says, I believe the Bible is the word of God, than to fall for the snares of a Muslim who says the Bible is corrupted. They're more dangerous because they claim to be Christians who believe the Bible. Muslim says he's not a Christian. The Bible's corrupt. Right? But one thing I want you to say, King of Kings, most Joe's witnesses don't know anything. They're victims who've been brainwashed, taken captive by Satan through this organization. So don't hate them. They're deceived, despised organization. Daryl not. how can any Jew who believes the Old Testament say the name of a creature is the only name in all the earth under heaven that can save when they know that's only something you can say about Jehovah's name? So if he's a creature, you're telling me the name of a creature has now supplanted the name of Jehovah, the authority of Jehovah? Yeah, Daryl not. They're told not to debate and engage arguments. So you can't debate them. Ask questions. Just, and you know, show your puzzle. Man, I'm puzzled. Jesus' name is the only name by which anyone can be saved, right? Yeah. But he's not Jehovah, right? Yeah. And he doesn't have the name Jehovah. So you're telling me the name of a creature is mightier and greater than the name of Jehovah? Man, I'm shocked. See, that's what you do. And then you shake them. And leave it at that. Don't tell them. Uh, wow, man, that's like, it almost sounds like blasphemy. I'm sorry. Right? So you see how you destroy that pathetic argument. Jehovah gave this creature this authority to forgive, to heal, and save. Because that means Jehovah has deified a creature. In fact, Jehovah exalted the name of a creature to be greater than his own name. Right? You see why that pathetic argument won't work, even with Unitarians? Jehovah has exalted a creature and authorized a creature to do what the Old Testament says only Jehovah does. And on top of that, exalted the name of a creature to be greater and higher than his own. Right? Does that make sense? But let's revisit Isaiah 45, 21 and 23 one more time so I can end it. With Philippians 2.11. Okay. Isaiah 45, 21, 23. One more time. Let it sink in. Exactly, King of Kings. This should make your heart break for them. 
right? Because they're victims. They've been brainwashed. Isaiah 45, 21 and 23. We need 21 and 22 as well. Read with me, guys. Make your report. Present your case. Let them consult together in unity. Who foretold, foretold this long ago and declared it from times past? Is it not I, Jehovah? There is no other God but me, a righteous God and a Savior. There's none beside me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no one else. By myself I have sworn. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and will not return. To me every knee will bend, every tongue will swear loyalty. To me every knee will bend and every tongue will swear loyalty. Philippians 2, 10 to 11. Philippians 2, 10 to 11. To me every knee will bend and every tongue will swear loyalty. Philippians 2, 10 to 11. So that in the name of Jesus, there's that name of Jesus again. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. Every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the ground. And every tongue should openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul, what in the world did you just do? You just took Isaiah 45, 23 and applied it to Jesus. That every knee in all creation will bend to Jesus and every tongue will swear to Jesus that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What did you do, Paul? <whistles> Time for the icing of the cake so we can close today's session. Okay. Icing on the cake and close today's session. You ready for the icing on the cake? Because we had a five course meal. Now we need dessert. You ready for dessert? Five course meal. Now we need the dessert. Psalm chapter three, verse eight. Psalm three, verse eight. Psalm 3, verse 8. Salvation belongs to Jehovah. Does it say belongs to Jehovah and a creature? Salvation belongs to Jehovah. Your blessing is upon your people. Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9. Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9. Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9. But as for me... With the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from Jehovah. Does it say salvation belongs to Jehovah and a creature? Salvation comes from Jehovah and a creature or Jehovah alone? Full stop. Right? Jehovah alone, right? You got it? Everyone got it, right? But I, I'm really confused, man. I'm lost. I am lost. Revelation 7, verses 9 to 17. I am lost. Revelation 7, verses 9 to 17. Jehovah alone saves. Salvation comes from him and belongs to him alone. Not Job and a creature. Well, I'm lost. Revelation 7, verses 9 to 17. Here's why I'm lost, Andrew and everyone else. Revelation 7, verse 9 to 17. After this, I saw and look. Pay attention now. After this, I saw and look. A great crowd which no man was able to number a host of human lives so numerous you could not count them which no man was able to number out of all nations and tribes read this is their bible and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb dressed in white robes and there was palm branches in their hands now notice 10 and they keep shouting with a loud voice salvation they keep shouting with a loud voice saying salvation we owe to God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. What? Salvation we owe to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. I can't believe this. Well, then let's read. Continue 11, always 17. All the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Let the praise and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the hour, honor and the power and the strength be. <clears throat> Sorry, lost my place. 
be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now notice 13, 17. In response, one of the elders said to me, these who are dressed in the white robes, who are they and where do they come from? So right away I said to him, my Lord, meaning sir, not my Lord like my master whom I worship. You are the one who knows. You know better than me. And he said to them, notice who they are. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. If you take a garment and you dip it in something red, it, became, it becomes stained. But notice how pure the blood of Jesus is. His blood made their robes absolutely white, signifying the blood of Jesus made them absolutely pure, absolutely perfect, absolutely holy. And because of his blood, they are now worthy to stand before God forever without God ever getting angry with them, all because the blood of Jesus made them worthy to stand before God. Because now notice what he says in 15. That is why the blood of Jesus, that is why they are before the throne of God and they are rendering him sacred, sacred service day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will spread his tent over them they will hunger no more, nor thirst anymore. Neither will the sun beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. Because the Lamb, He's the reason, who's in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and will guide them to springs of waters of life. And God will wipe out every tear from their eyes. Okay, guys, I don't understand. Psalm 3.8, Jonah 2.9 state, Salvation belongs to Jehovah. Salvation comes from Jehovah, Him alone. Revelation 7, 9 to 17, a great number of human lives, so numerous they could not be counted, dressed in white robes, white signifying their absolute perfect purity and sinlessness. Robes that were made white by the holy blood of the Lamb, meaning Jesus made them absolutely pure and holy and worthy to remain in the presence of the Father forever. They broke out in praise saying, salvation we owe to our God and to the Lamb. What in the world is going on with this New Testament? What is going on with the New Testament writers? Why are they saying things about Jesus? The Old Testament says about Jehovah God alone. And yet Jesus is not the Father nor the Holy Spirit. Why are they doing this? Why, folks? Why? Why are they doing this? And this was the Jehovah Witness translation. You see, so Acts 4:13, let me give me let me give you a testimony to how beautiful the Holy Spirit is. Acts 4, 7 and 13 back to back. Acts 4 verse 7 and jump to 13. Yep. Watch here. Yep, this was their Bible. Acts 4, 7, and 13. Okay. Now, 7 and 8, we're going to read A as well. They stood Peter and John in their midst and began to question them, by what power or in whose name did you do this? Now, we're going to read 8 and 13 as well. Verse 8 and 13, I'll read. Thank Protestant for serving us and the admins for helping me. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit filled Peter to testify, it's the name of Jesus. But now, let me show you verse 13 and tie it in with the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 and tie it in with the Holy Spirit. Now, when they saw the outspokenness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, meaning they were not trained formally by the rabbis, they had not gone to rabbinic school and received a proper education in Jewish theology. And ordinary men, they were astonished, and they began to realize that they had been with Jesus. Folks, this is what I want to leave you with. Here you have fishermen who hadn't gone to theological school, who are not taught by theologians or scholars. But notice what the text says. Because they were with Jesus, Jesus filled them with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gave them wisdom and knowledge to silence the scholars and theologians and make them look like fools. So what's the point? If, like the apostles... You walk with Jesus, spend time with Jesus, 
and ask Jesus to fill you with the Holy Spirit, you too will do wonders for the glory of Jesus. And I'm a testimony. Here's, here's the testimony. No college, no seminary, no university, highest education, a high school diploma equivalent, GED. So the same God that worked through the apostles, same God that's working through us today if we believe and trust. And notice the sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not necessarily speaking in tongues. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is to boldly, unashamedly <clears throat> proclaim the glory, the beauty, the power, the majesty of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Notice, when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, boldly, outspokenly, he testified to who Jesus is. That's how you know you're filled with the Spirit. Because the role of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus Christ through you. John 16, 14 and 15. John 16, 14 and 15. John 16, 14 and 15. Speaking of the... The Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, that one will glorify me because he will receive from what is mine and will declare it to you. All the things that the Father has are mine. That is why I said he receives from what is mine and declares it to you. So that one, the Holy Spirit, will come and glorify me through you. Fill you to glorify me. That's how you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be bold. Outspoken, unashamed, and testifying about the beauty, the glory, the majesty, the love, the excellence of Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved Son. Okay. So now, guys, November 20, I can receive bad news from my lawyer in the other state that she's held me in contempt of court because she wants me to pay the legal fees of my ex-wife's lawyer to reward her. I need Jesus now to show up, rebuke that judge, silence that dog, save me from this debt, keep me out of jail, so I can stay here and continue to, the work, to do the work of the Lord. November 20 is a big day, folks. I need deliverance. So please pray for me that the Lord will save me, have mercy on me, forgive me when I fail, fight for my daughters, my angels, and bring them to me. Thanksgiving, Christmas around the corner, and I may not have them. Pray God will comfort them and fill them and provide through me for them and keep me out of prison. Listen, may I go to prison for preaching the gospel, for glorifying Jesus, but not because of a wicked, immoral, adulterous woman to pay her fees for her sins. Not because of that. Go to jail because I take a stand for traditional marriage. Go to jail because I speak out against homosexuality, sexual morality, and all these perversions. Amen. Go to jail for that because he's worthy. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. YM, are you Abraham Matthew? Oh, I thought you, you said because keeping in my dreams. Well, pray against it for favor. All right. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I don't know if I'll be on tomorrow. Check, check me out. But pray I find a place by December and the provisions for that place because my other brother is going to be joining me at the end of December because I need to find my own place. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Fight for us. Preserve us. Wash us in your blood. Fill us with your spirit. Bless my daughters and fight for them in Jesus' name. Take care.